Welcome to the Reason and Theology Show, everyone. We are continuing our lecture series here on the Summa Theologica. Going to be joined in just a moment by our very own resident scholar, Dr. Matthew Minard. And as I said, he's going to continue with his lectures here on the Summa. This time he's going to be going over the virtue of charity in the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas. And I really look forward to this because I think it, we, it all, myself included, benefit from learning more about the virtue of charity. So Dr. Matthew Minard going to be joining us coming up next. Dr. Minard, how are you? All right. Wow, that was faster than I expected. There wasn't that long run up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I changed the introduction a little bit. All right. <laughs> Probably better, you know. It comes Hope up it didn't with... sneak up on you. No, that's all right. I mean, you know, it's like the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They blow when they will. So Right. Well, I, I got a chance to you know, change the setup here a little bit. And I rigged it to where I can do these videos at the beginning where I don't have to, uh, you know, edit anything. I don't have to, I just click a button and boom, we're, we're uh -huh. going. Yeah, I like and that. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit easier than it was before. So I don't have to have that long introduction any longer. <laughs> yeah. But you now have this, this sort of, you know, I should be sitting like this. <laughs> out I, could, I could put it back on that one right there. <laughs> Boy, I, I just... <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm really far from you. So that's, I thought, yeah, that's kind of imposing that way. So <laughs> you know, but I feel like, yeah, you know, I got so I thought, it. yeah, this, this might be a little bit better. Whenever I have <laughs> discussions like. and dialogues, I can't put a second camera right in front of me, however, because that other camera that shows the larger view would yeah. then be blocked by the camera in front of me. Well, so. guys, this is why you got to donate to to Michael and get him like a drone that can like drop in with a camera and then. Come <laughs> <back>. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would be pretty incredible. Yeah, I've yeah. I've actually thought about getting a drone and just seeing what it looks like whenever you have a camera on top of these things and just fly it around. I've I've thought about doing. So yeah, I mean, probably you would need it. You need something that's actually balanced because probably the drone is still going to have too much give in it. So right, right. <laughs> it'll be like you know, I'm showing my age is like the the Blair Witch Project equivalent of reason and theology. Cameras kind of. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good stuff. Well, uh, all right. Dr. Minard, you can uh, take it away. I'll, I'll get off the screen like I normally do, but I'll be here listening um, as soon as you need me to come back. Let me know. Okay. Sounds good. Well, tonight we're going to, well, whenever you're watching this, but it's moving toward the evening here. We're going to be moving into the the, the inner sanctum, really, of St. Thomas's moral uh, theology. So let's go ahead and begin, begin with a prayer, quite appropriate. Um, Heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, everywhere present and filling all things, Treasury of blessings and giver of life, come dwell within us, cleanse us of all stains, and save our souls, O gracious one. All right. Well, again, give me a moment for those of you who've been following me along. I'm not going to take very long to recap, but I've got some important connecting points. Because really, we've, we're riding a kind of high wave again in the Summa, and we're coming to a high point from which some things are going to flow, really, for the whole rest of what we discuss for the next four lectures, on the various infused Christian moral virtues, prudence, justice, courage, and temperance. We're in the treatise on charity. So we're in the second part of the second part of the Summa, which sometimes was called in later um, scholastic manuals and in scho the scholastic tradition, special moral theology or specific moral theology, the theology of the virtues, uh, which comes after the first part, which deals with the general principles. So here we talk about particular virtues and vices, faith, hope, charity, and all of their connected uh, um, acts. And then especially when we get into the moral virtues, they're connected virtues uh, as well. There's a whole cortege of a whole, um, uh, what am I looking for? But assembly of virtues that goes around the virtue of prudence, for instance. All of that's discussed here in its detail. But in the first part of the second part, we talked about the general uh, division of the virtues and how what we need to understand about virtue as such, virtue qua virtue, not prudence as a virtue, and now prudence considered in its various parts. 
<clears throat> at the beginning of the first part of the second part, we discussed beatitude. As we talked way back at the beginning of our time, the whole of theology is polarized, we might say, magnetized by its uh, central formal aspect, its central outlook, its central mystery, the mystery of the Godhead, triune. Theology is the study of God in the inner mystery of his life communicated to us and all things viewed precisely in light of that mystery of God. I'm not merely considering God as our creator, God as our Lord, God as first cause, not even in a sense God as first being, cause of all being. God is the Godhead, one and triune. And we could look, for instance, in the first part of the Summa at both the hinge between the treatment of God as one and God as triune, as well as the hinge between the treatment of God, one and triune, and the whole rest of the Summa at, at two major important points structurally of the Summa. There's a, a, a question that discusses God's beatitude, which then opens up the treatise or subtreatise on the Trinity. And then the discussion of the Trinity comes to its end with the discussion of the divine missions, which spills over the sending of God in, in the person of the Word and the Holy Spirit, spills over into the first order discussion of the divine missions, namely all of providence, creation, etc. And that's where we had the discussion relatively brisk of creation, the angels, man, and sin. Then the beginning of the first part of the second part, we had just like a blasting light reminding us, just as the treatise on the Trinity does in the first part, of the fact that God is the magnetizing center of the whole moral part of the Summa. It's so easy to miss it that actually historically it did get overlooked. So much so that if you were to read the moral theology of um, even a saint, patron saint of moral theologians, St. Alphonsus, it would be easy to miss the centrality and importance of the treatise on beatitude. And yet like a flash of divine light, these five questions then place the framework of the whole of moral theology. Yes, for St. Thomas, but ultimately, at least for a sound tradition, it's here that the Eastern topic, the Eastern term, theosis, would then be inserted for discussion. How is theology, or sorry, how is moral theology the study of our becoming divine? And so then the whole swath of these two huge volumes of the Summa Theologiae are under the light of beatitude. But it has this kind of cascade, right? You go from beatitude to all of a sudden clunk, you're down into the treatise on human acts. And in the treatise on human acts, you're talking about all the various acts of intellect and will that go into making a choice. And then we go on to talking about the passions, and then we go into talking about virtues, etc. So we're going all the way down through all these details. And it ends with a discussion of grace. And you see that discussion of grace opens us up to then the three theological virtues at the beginning of the Secunda Secundae. Now, of primacy, the highest of the theological virtues, the famous, you know, dictum from St. Paul about faith, hope, and charity, charity remaining, is the divine love that we have, poured into our hearts through grace, by which God gives us a communication in his own self-love. We're going to talk about this in just a moment here. But we can't really discuss, and here's you know, typical Thomas with his method, can't discuss charity until we've done our discussion of faith and hope. Especially faith. Hope helps us to, to ferret out aspects of how our wills are elevated. More on that soon. Faith is needed above all, though, because we need to understand the supernaturality of the truths that will guide our life, the illumination that we receive through the gift of faith that elevates the elan of our intellect beyond anything nature could ever have imagined. And yet, nonetheless, not against the grain of our nature, but rather supernaturally above it. Elevating from within what theologians came to call the obediential potency, 
that our intellect has and making it grasp not merely truths that it has abstracted from its knowledge and experience throughout a lifetime and from the reigning culture around us that helps us learn the great truths that have come down to us through the generations, but above all, the first truth, he who is most trustworthy and the highest of all truths, God himself, and to assent with actually the very same sort of knowledge that God has of himself. Although, you know, cut to our human uh, capacities and cut to our state as wayfarers. Faith and hope are both virtues of wayfarers. The Christian life is lived in two ways. There is the Christian life in its, we'll say, proper sense, or the sense that we mean it here when we talk about it in moral theology. We're talking about the study of human acts here below as wayfarers. But then there's the Christian life lived in glory. And in that life, faith and hope are no longer needed because they are um, adjuncts. They are, or not adjuncts, but they're replacements that are given to us. Vision is the replacement, or better yet, faith gives way to vision and hope then rejoices in possession. We will see that charity remains. So Thomas feels the need, though, to talk about faith and charity because you must speak, or faith and hope before charity because you must speak of the divine mouth that feeds our charity, our love, and must speak of hope so that we can understand the way that we may incline trustfully with a supernatural assurance in the redemptive omnipotence of our God. But charity then is actually the center of the whole bright light of the Secunda Secunda. For charity will magnetize all of the virtues. It is their end. It is really the one thing necessary. And it becomes the sun around which all the rest of the Christian life will gravitate. Even our spiritual life and contemplation will occur and take place by the movement of the Holy Spirit, inflaming our love so that we may taste, to the paltry way, degree that we can here below, the divine mysteries. That's the gift of wisdom, which actually perfects our charity, but also perfects our faith and hope as well, ultimately. For we contemplate there the truths that we know by faith and the, and the truths that are our hope in salvation. So the treatise on charity then spills out over, over the rest of these virtues that will be discussed in the next four lectures. So we've had the treatise on God, one and triune, which then through the treatise on, uh, or through the question on the divine missions, which seems one thing and off, actually begins the grand swath of things going forth from God. It's a pivotal moment in the Summa Theologiae as we turn now to the economy of salvation the whole rest of the Summa. And so we come from the divine missions, which are going to be taken up on and again throughout now the rest of the Summa, really, through the rest of that first part. And then Beatitude lights the way, but it seems to get lost in the details, just to be ended with the treatise on grace, which then expands out through our three powers, through faith, hope, and charity, elevating our mind and elevating our will, elevating our mind and elevating the spiritual appetite, the spiritual love that we have. And that plays out now to illuminate the rest of these treatises in the moral life. So think of faith, hope, and charity, the three treatises on the theological virtues as a piece really leading to the capstone that is charity. So again, we won't see the same level of, of luminosity until we hit the great guiding motif at the beginning of the, the tertia pars, the motive of the incarnation, the grace of union, Christ's capital grace, to understand the reason why God became incarnate to the degree that we can, of course, explain this theologically, to understand the theology of the hypostatic union and to understand the implications of that union 
for the church of which Christ is the head and spouse. There again, we will have the bright flash of God's gift, his uncreated gift in the strongest sense of uncreated. In the case of the redemptive incarnation. But now we come to the treatise on charity. So we've, we've talked a bit about grace and faith and hope, how the gift of supernatural grace is something we do not merit the beginning of, although through our acts of the theological virtues, sorry, there was a little fly in front of me, our acts of the theological virtues, we can merit an increase of grace. Theology of merit is discussed at some length. If you look, for instance, at a text like Garigou Lagrange's Treatise on Grace, you'll find a good discussion of this. But it flows, the gift of grace, into our minds, into our intellects, and into our will. The will, the human will, is not merely a power to push itself along, to push us along through life. We've got willpower. Our will is the spontaneous, but then also free and self-elicited, in technical scholastic verbiage, appetite for the good. More on that in a moment. We should, though, clean up this word charity. The word charity, of course, has a, a kind of blasé uh, meaning in our day-to-day our -day talk. You say, you know, don't be, well, be charitable or give to charity. Give your money to, to helpful causes. Be charitable. Don't be mean. We talked, we'll talk a bit more about this. We talk about justice. It's really a question of geniality and friendliness. But from the, the Greek, charis, whatever you want to say, grace or kindness or favor or life even, we get the word charity in Latin, caritas, divine love. And it's necessary to remember all throughout our discussions this lofty sense of the word charity. Charity means divine love. I don't like to even use the Greek agape. Although I know that that, of course, is scriptural it has its, and it has its place. But because of the countless precisions that are attached, at least if we're interpreting someone like St. Thomas, to the word charity, I prefer charity. Because as we're going to see, it's 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 not merely a question of contrasting eros and agape. We'll see instead how charity is best understood in terms of friendship, not some kind of contrast to eros. Although something like that will be in play when we talk here in a moment about the um, contrast between charity and hope. Our most fundamental bent of will by our nature. So not as children of God, but just as creatures. Is to love God above ourselves. There are some famous texts in St. Thomas about the angels, for instance. Would the angels have had a love of God above all else, even if they didn't have grace, actually? But do the angels by natural love, love God above all else? And he says, yes. This is actually true of all things. There's a great love which magnetizes the whole universe. Love that makes the stars go round, as Dante says. All things have most deeply in their inclination a love of God above all else, according to the Thomistic metaphysic, actually, just in philosophy, technically. There's a sense in which Love is attributable transcendentally to all beings, whether it be natural love, elicited knowledge, volitional love that animals have, or the freely rational or even intellectual love that are given uh, from the depths of a creature, such as man or the angels. Love magnetizes all things. And all things technically love the common good, more than themselves, not in the sense, not in the sense, not in the sense, not in the sense that the action of the individual for the sake of the collective, but rather the highest thing that we, we as humans, for instance, can do together is to live together and then to offer all things to God 
by means of the virtue of religion, which is actually a species of justice. This is at the level of nature, of course, I'm speaking. By the deepest fibrils of our being, by the deepest fibrils of who we are, we love God, or we're at least called and magnetized so as to love God above all things, more than ourselves even. This remains one of the interior contradictions at the heart of all the damned, is that they break, they turn away this fundamental elan eternally. They wrench their being from its most fundamental desire that makes willing possible. And St. Thomas makes this remark way back in the Prima Pars that if this weren't the case, well, charity would destroy nature. Wow. Oh, well, let's nominally say that charity is the love of God poured out into our hearts by which we love God above all others. We're going to have to give some specification to that here. But if we take that as our basic background nominal notion, well, if we didn't love God by nature above, above ourselves, but then all of a sudden grace were to make us love God above ourselves, you would have a kind of turning of us from our native egoism, for lack of better terms, to a sort of altruism for divine altruism for God. I don't like talking about egoism and altruism. It's an unhelpful contrast, to be honest. But it works here. If our nature did not love God above all things more than itself, or better to put it, not our nature, because natures don't love, if we didn't love God above all things by our very nature, Charity, grace, wouldn't fulfill nature, it would break it. But, let's be careful. For it is one thing to love God by our very nature according to the degree that we could possibly know him by our nature. We can love God as our first source of being. We love God as the creator. If, by a kind of mental game, we were to imagine a human nature that we actually can't really imagine, except in its abstract sense, not in the state of grace, but merely called to a natural felicity. Such humans in a state of mere nature, or sometimes called pure nature, would still need to love God above all other things, recognizing this above all through acts of the virtue of religion. But the love of charity is something more. For you see, as the philosophers knew quite well, there can be no concourse, there can be no communion, there can be no society between man and the gods. They're all too distant from each other, this creature and the gods. And the, the Christian knows this all the better. For the blinding truth slowly but surely, over the course of salvation history, was drilled into the people of Israel. So wonderfully set out in many places, but for instance, at the end of Job, is the fact of God's transcendence. And so the Christian, the Jewish believer too, would say, there can't be such friendship. And yet, and yet there is. For our Lord says to his disciples, the Last Supper, I do not call you just servants, but friends. But friends. And here we have the master analogy. The master super analogy, really. Because it's a, it's a uh, mystery of faith that is utilized by St. Thomas, but often underappreciated. But what light it sh sheds on understanding so much of spirituality, so much of what one finds in the truest doctrine of the fathers, the truest doctrine of the church on grace, the truest language of the mystics, the truest language of the spiritual theologians. The burning core of Christian morality is friendship with God. Of course, friendship by which we share one will 
well, two wills really, but we share, and we could say technically three wills if we looked at Christ and his two wills, but that being said, that we share one love with God. The very love of God itself is our love by a kind of indwelling, the love of friendship. And of course, this purifies us though. It's not a get out of jail free card. You know, Christianity is, of course, a morality by being more than a morality. Christianity is more than religion by being more than religion, or it is a religion, I should say, while being more than a religion. It is divine friendship. And so this is where we see the contrast between hope and charity. Hope is, above all, a trust that centers on the fact that we incline our will by the gift of God's grace with an assurance in his divine omnipotence, his unfailing divine omnipotence, his will that all men be saved, at least his antecedent will that all men be saved. We incline our will trustfully in God who redeems us so that we may per perform acts befitting of our rebirth in grace. And that through the storms and trials of life, we fall not into mortal sin. And with our ongoing purification, less and less, we hope into venial sin. And instead, live trustfully in the providential plan that has been given to us with a divine trust, though. It is like the good of God is embraced as our good. As something that, yes, indeed, perfects us all the way to the eternal life that we already be, live now, but whose state of perfection is the hereafter. In clunky Latin language, this is referred to as amor concupiscentiae, love of concupiscence. But the word concupiscence has baggage. It has, of course, a meaning that indicates our love as it has been turned away from its true orientation to God. Concupiscence is the, the upsurging of the passions. But concupiscence can also merely mean love that is incorporative, love of things for the sake of my improvement. And so, you know, one can appreciate in itself, you know, a, uh, you know the discipline of um, gardening, the art of gardening, right? I mean, there's, there is a certain beauty to that something peaceful and wonderful, especially when things are actually growing that time of year. Finally, we're past the frost here in the mountains, hopefully. Um, but gardening is loved. I, you know, I have a love for gardening because I, I like to get fresh tomatoes and fresh herbs and fresh uh, cucumbers and whatnot come July. It's a love that is for the incorporating of something in, into me. Not merely, you know, the food, but the whole experience of picking it with the kids, etc. And, you know, I can also love it for its own sake, but in the end, it's, it's something that's still uh, instrumental and used by humans. It's not the same thing as sharing with another person. Loving another person for his or her own sake. But let us be careful here, because I would like to make a distinction within Thomas's approach here. It's something that is in um, Aristotle, where he talks about friendship. It's something that's not often clear enough when Thomas talk about friendship. This is very important, what I'm about to say. It was a little book by Cardinal Journet that brought this to my attention. Uh, you know, probably had heard it before, but spending time meditating on his book, Entretien uh, sur la Charité, or Charité, uh, his lectures, a retreat on charity that he gave. There is a love of benevolence, amor benevolentiae, that is one directional. I can feel benevolence for someone else and wish their good. Do you hear this? Friendship is willing the good of the other. Yes. But I can do this if I were to, an example from Cardinal Journet, walk into a church and see someone who is troubled and will him all the best and pray for him at that moment. 
or for instance, I'm at the uh, you know funeral, I'm cantering a funeral for the church, and I don't know the family at all. You know, an elderly relative who hasn't been to church in a long time, and I may have never even seen them. We have a lot of old parishioners. Someone in the someone in the nursing home. Don't really know the family all that well. They've all gone off, become Roman Catholic, or you know, they're not from the area. Maybe don't practice, who knows? And I see, you know, see them and sense their loss. I can pray for them as I'm cantering. I should be praying for them as I'm cantering. I'm willing their good as a as a, a kind of Christian fraternity. But that sort of benevolence is still one directional. God does not call us merely to have a love of God above all things, right? So we got to get everything in order so that we make sure that we do our duties to God first. Uh, yes, but let us not reduce charity accidentally to justice. God extends to us rather mutuality. An entire other set of lectures could be given on the theme of the divine indwelling, which sheds such light on this topic. Yes, through grace, God comes to dwell in our souls. And this, we see this above all in, in faith and hope, yes, but most all in charity. Because through the gift of charity or through the theological virtue of charity, God raises our love, our capacity for taking joy and rest in a good, so that it is exactly the same essential love shared by the three persons of the Trinity. The gift of, gift of, I keep saying that, but the theological virtue of charity is like having a heart transplant with God. We are enabled to love God with God's own love, to love all of his friends, all of his potential friends, sinners, all of his creation with the same love that he loves with. Yes, it is a love that is participated. Yes, it is a love that is conditioned by our faith, which is obscure. And here we see the great theme that, that drives the Palamite theology of essence and energies coming out of the Cappadocian Fathers. To note the fact that, yes, we love with an uncreated love, still cut to a certain human level, but it's uncreated. Yes. That is what charity is. And by means of it, God dwells in us and we dwell in God. For by love, our heart, our will, is carried outward to the thing that we love. It takes rest in the thing it loves. It's present to that which is beloved. It takes joy in the very presence and being of the beloved. And so God who takes joy in himself gives us the joy with which he rejoices eternally, his beatitude, and enables us to give God himself back to God in this love. So we find ourselves elevated in charity to the very beatitude that has been given to us in seed, germinally, in the gift of grace. And this is why faith and hope, which are cut to our state of not seeing and of not achieving, will fade away. But we love God now above all things, and we will love God above all things exactly the same in the hereafter. Only there, our charity will be beatific charity. It will be in its essence the same, but in its existential state. How then marvelously fulfilled. And there we will have the dawn in which what was seen by faith and what was hoped in by charity is grasped in vision and rested in through joy. That 
is what the virtue of charity is in its most profound essence and its object, which is God loved above all else for his own sake, with his own love. Now, the deformations of charity. Be charitable, someone tells us. Well, what that means is be friendly. Friendliness, I shouldn't, I don't bat it away, but friendliness is it's got its place. Go to the treatise on justice. We owe friendliness to others for crying out loud. If you're unfriendly, it's not actually a matter of being uncharitable. It's a matter of being unjust. And how often we are mm, ready to be angry whenever we are accused of being unjust. How sensitive we are when others are unjust to us. If we are not friendly adequately, we're unjust. No, be charitable to others. Hmm. Well, what does that mean? Give to charity. Hmm. Well, okay, I can give money. Once again, go over to the treatise on justice. It's a liberality. If you are well-to-do, or even of moderate means, to be honest, and you're not ready to be generous spontaneously, as is appropriate in a way that's, you know, with all those little caveats that Aristotle gives so wonderfully, to the right person at the right time, in the right way, with the right attitude. If you're not ready to do that, you're unjust. Give to charity. Fraternal charity. What is fraternal charity? Charity of brothers. Women are excluded? No, we know that's not true. Fraternal charity, which is reflected and deformed in these notions of be charitable, give to charity, is the reflection of God's friendship for others now in our lives. For when we truly are friends with someone, we love the friends who share in the same motive for friendship that that person has, or that person that person shares with us, right? As humans, there are different reasons to have friendships. Sometimes friendships are merely utility. Sometimes friendships are based on, you know, the bonds of youth. So I don't expect people to, to immediately be friends with, you know, people that I knew in my youth or from graduate school or from my days as a monk or from my days of wandering about after leaving the monastery but before becoming a graduate student. But sometimes the circles inter intersect. So for example, man who was my best man is a very <clears throat> faithful and ardent soul. He and his wife immediately intersected well with my wife for friendship, as did, you know, other, another couple I still stay in touch with from graduate school, because the bond of our friendship was the truth and the faith above all else. We shared the same love and therefore it was so easy for friendships to be added there too, at different degrees, of course. Well, imagine then the same love is the love of charity, the love of being incorporated into <clears throat> the body of Christ. We are parts of one and the same organism, parts of one and the same mystical body, moved by the same love. And those who have not yet converted, they are potentially. Maybe they even are mutely if they have an implicit faith. But even those who are in a state of mortal sin are implicitly, here below at least as wayfarers, to be incorporated in the body of Christ. There's the whole problem of the damned, one that we can not handle here, but, you know, we'll uh, set that aside. I mean, I hope it's not a question, but we can, we can consider it if need be. Because really, can one love with charity? the damned, but it's in a side light. The true central point here is through the gift of charity, we are incorporated into this great uh, family of friendship that now we share with God and we love all persons with this same exact love. And technically lower things that we don't 
you know, uh, share the intellect or intellectual nature with animals, etc. We use them, animals, tools, etc. We use them as part of the the tools of executing charity. But fraternal charity, and this is what's important. Fraternal charity is a concretization. Sorry, I was like searching for a word there. It is the concretization of the love of God. In our brethren, we do for the least truly and effectively not effectively in the sort of colloquial sense, but with true efficiency, with true efficacy. We do this for God in acts of kindness and beneficence out of a divine love, not merely kindness and that be, be charitable, but really willing well for others. In our, yes, freely giving like our merciful father, Hence, we see um, the role of mercy as well in charity, freely giving to others, almsgiving. Yes, that's why almsgiving is, a, is a, uh, an act of charity. But also, too, hmm, in our fraternal correction of others, we call them back to the life of grace as is appropriate. And of course, we take joy in God. We love God above all else with a kind of savoring love. We experience the good order of our soul by knowing the peace of God. These are all acts of the virtue of charity. Now, I should like to, however, reflect for a moment on an example of how the deformation doesn't go all the way. Right, deformed accounts of charity, be charitable, eh, be kind. Well, okay, this is like a, a kind of, um, you know, ho-hum version of, uh, Christian humanist version of beneficence. Give to charity is of, of almsgiving. Uh, what a fraternal correction, though. Well, oh, there's a wonderful remark on this at the beginning of um, Le Vrai Vie Chrétien, The True Christian Life by Ambrose Gardet which is going to come out from uh, CUA Press, God willing. I think it's in, in the, the winter catalog. We're handling the, the edits of it. It was these notes from his nephew, Henri Dominique Gardet, where he, he, he's going through the, the outline of an 800-page book that Father Ambrose Gardet was going to write on the Christian life, and he never got to it. But when he gets to fraternal correction, he gets, it's in his craw. Because fraternal charity is charity. Fraternal charity and its love, its joy, its peace, its acts of mercy, its acts of uh, beneficence, its acts of almsgiving. These are all reflections of, well, either experiences of the peace of beatitude or reflections of the merciful giving of God to others, whose first divine name, ad extra, is mercy or the merciful one. And also, too, though, he says, what a fraternal correction. And he says, our moral theologians have come to tell us, mm, listen, it's pretty difficult to be able to do an act of fraternal correction without leading someone to sin. You know, when we correct someone, we sound like, you know, what the nattering nabobs of negativity, Nixon or whoever that is, right? We, we risk making someone angry if we correct them. So our moral theologians say, eh, rarely is this really the case only when all the conditions come together, which isn't too often. Really, you got to know someone and be in the right position. He said, you know, our Lord didn't seem to temper his doctrine that much. You know, he didn't come along and say, the Latin is si como de pos, uh, oh, yeah, si como de posimus. If we can do so in a, a fitting way. Christ didn't say that. He said, go to your brother, tell him he's wrong, do it by yourself, maybe then bring a couple from the church. You know, it's, it's got an escalation scale. But look at the saints. We don't even need to turn to examples that would be drawn from, you know, saints who are denouncing you know, the excesses in Constantinople, for instance. 
preaching of St. John Chrysostom against the wealthy. No, I mean, you can, but we could consider the, the heights of fraternal charity because fraternal charity is not actually merely just found in the giving of alms, the being beneficent to others out of the, 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 uh, the very friendship and, and uh, overpouring um, generosity of our supernatural God who's given us his supernatural love to then be the instruments of. Above all, the greatest of all uh, cases of charity will be in heaven, where this is no longer needed, but joy and peace and love remain. And so the greatest of spiritual friendships, which would be this shared friendship in God, will be the one that takes the greatest shared joy in the mysteries of God. And so we have, for example, the story of St. Benedict and St. Scholastica. At the end of her life, she wants to stay with the holy monk. He's away from the monastery, but they're having their yearly meeting. Yes, fraternal and sororal charity is active here. They're speaking all night of divine things. And anyone who's done this knows that it's marvelous. I know a, a priest friend who stayed up. Oh, my goodness happened to be in the area and we stayed up late into the night visiting and talking of divine things. It was wonderful. I cherish that, that memory. That it's a foretaste of heaven. It's a foretaste of heaven. But St. Benedict knows his rules and he must get back to his monastery. Ready to leave and yet his sister, who has the good grace of loving more, bows her head and cries out in prayer to prevent him. And he hears outside, drip, 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 and soon the downpour and storm are upon him. He says, sister, what have you done? I'm forced to stay here with you. And yet then they continue into the night, speaking the mysteries of God. That is the shared fraternal life above all. Yes, we must share or we must become the truly um, generous with a divine generosity, not merely a justice generosity, uh, instruments of God in the outpouring of his love providentially through beneficence, through almsgiving. But we must share the same society in God with joy. And that should animate in various ways, a desire to correct our brethren, our brethren who are fully astray, even in a state of mortal sin, actually, as well as our brethren who are close to us. And of course, this is going to have, have layers to it. I'm very bound to correct my wife fraternally, and she is bound to connect, uh, correct me. Not because she wants to sit in judgment upon me, but rather to come to me, to recall me to the same love that is, yes, salvific, but is also the cause, the bond of our greatest joy, of our greatest peace. That's the inner soul of what fraternal correction is. But let's also, and I think this is important when we're discussing this, and if you may um, excuse the fact that I'm typing, pulling up a file here. It's, it's just a, a lovely quote came to my mind as I'm talking. How couldn't it? Whenever you hear it, Gardet is so wonderful. It's easy for those of us who, who take up theology in this kind of classical form, this form that is very traditional and truth be told, very conservative in its language to be accused of not being sensitive to the social needs of the gospel, the social effects of the gospel, uh, to set, you know, charitable giving aside and, and to forget mm, social justice. Let's not speak too much of that, although perhaps it'll come up when we talk about the treatise on justice. Social justice is our term. We can thank Luigi Taparelli for it. Uh, it's been bastardized in the current climate. But in any event, no, those of us who have this theology, if we take it seriously, and how often we don't, and I say that, you know, all of a sudden I'm going to come down from my rhetoric, how often this is something 
that in our own examination, my own examination, I think that I've not lived up to. Do we take seriously those words, all those acts of omission that are listed out by our Savior? If you did these for the least of me, or if you did not do these for the least of me, you did them or did not do them for me. You did not live the life of charity. Now, the life of charity is not reduced to these acts. And this is what so often a kind of hackneyed conservatism says. Well, yes, yes, yes. Doing well for others is, of course, our duty as Christians. And maybe even, yes, it's the, the act of charity itself, loving and sharing in this, this fraternal desire to lift up our brethren so that they may, they may also share, not merely in the goods of this world, but in the, the divine goods that we're all called to. Yes, yes, yes. But ultimately, we have to love God above all else, right? Yes. Obviously, the love of God above all else, which is reflected in the participation in the very life poured out from the head of the church through his liturgy and his sacraments, is of central importance, and it is the center of the whole of our, um, though, sorry, phone vibrates, you get, you get confused for a moment, is the center, the liturgy, the mass, the divine, uh, divine liturgy, all the sacraments are the center of our life spiritually. And we love other people precisely because we like them all to partake in that too. Otherwise the Christian life doesn't make any sense. It becomes humanitarianism. The love that, which fires us has a teleology that leads us toward the outpouring from Calvary, but which is ultimately an outpouring which will have beatific horizons. Yes, yes. But let us not forget that God has given us this kind of replacement for his visual, his visible countenance in our poor brethren. There we encounter Christ. Notice it's not, you know, you'll go and be, go and do Christ-like things for these people. In them and in loving them, you encounter Christ. I had experiences like this quite profoundly when I was caring for my, my grandmother, who could be a fiery old woman. My love, though, I miss quite a bit. My grandmother minored. Fiery old woman. And I experienced in her in her last days as I was there with her, um, Christ himself. But let me get this. See if it's going to come up. That's going to be the real problem. All right. So... Oh, I'm going to change this slightly. I see my copy editor's note, but so if you don't mind, allow me to, to, to take, uh, I'm going to go pretty far further than I even remember, but Father Gardet writes, therefore, luckily it's quite stentorian, so it won't be boring. Fraternal charity understood as a theological virtue, not merely a kind of justice, namely precisely as supernatural charity is what we are discussing here. The solidarity of these two loves is self-evident as soon as we, re we realize the uh, requirements of friendship. Indeed, the law of friendship requires a friend to extend his affection for his friend to everything that touches on the latter, to everything which he reasonably holds as being his good. Now from all eternity, God has his friendships. Righteous ones, indeed, true and legitimate friendships that God has precisely because they are divine. Therefore, if we claim to truly love God, we are not permitted to separate that which is united in his heart. We must take God in his entirety with everything that he loves, that is, with all men, as he has paternal affection for them. Or for he has paternal affection for them. The second commandment is similar to the first. Moreover, all this, which is quite marvelous, belongs to the common run of spirituality for all Christians. And let us push even further and behold the fact that Christ took upon himself this obvious conclusion in order that he may give it with his authority as the Son of God in his own person a new and utterly immediate and pressing foundation, one with great urgency. On his lips, 
the duty to love one's brothers takes on the proportions of being a new commandment. This new commandment I give to you, mandatum novum. Here we come to one of those marvelous passages of the work that we are analyzing, where theological wisdom, without losing anything of its power, regains the simplicity of the Christian life and the gospel's language. That here, theology and day-to-day -day life meet. To understand this aright, to understand the nature of fraternal charity, we must bear in mind this truth, namely that the eternal Son of God is one with the Father. Therefore, he who loves the Son loves the Father. Now, he who loves his neighbor loves, his, loves the Son. Our Lord asserted this identification repeatedly in his gospel. Above all, let us recall the moving depiction of the judgment day, as well as its conclusion. Truly, I say to you, every time that you do these things for one of these little ones, you do them for me. And here is the, the part that came to my mind. You do them for me. God says this, and he says it on divine authority by pledging his own truth. Just as the omnipotent Christ consecrated, this is a profound sentence, a whole profound idea, what we're going to hear here. And it's not liberal hogwash. It's not hogwash. It's not modernist claptrap. Father Gardet knows what he's saying. He's making all the appropriate distinctions. No one needs to get up in arms. Just as the omnipotent Christ consecrated bread as his body, he consecrated the poor as, his, as another self. Obviously not in the same way. And yet in a real way, nonetheless. And here the full extent and depth of God's design is uncovered before us. The object of our love for God remains unknown to us, and this fact, in the sense that the ascension has taken place, and this fact presents the great difficulty that frustrates this love and disconcerts us. Doubtlessly, Jesus Christ has filled the gulf. Nobody has seen God. The Son, who is in the Father's bosom, has described him to us. He has done even more than this. In him, we have touched the word of life with our own hands. However, this humanized vision of God uh, itself only lasted a few moments after which Christ departed, becoming in his own turn an invisible object of faith for us. Nonetheless, he did not completely depart, and we've come into contact with these visible survivals, slightly awkward expression, but we see what it means, of the God-man, namely the Eucharist and the Church, which is the body of Christ after the ascension, next to which our neighbor finds his place. This is my body, the Eucharist. He who hears you hears me, the church. You do them for me. Such deeds. Three creative utterances here, which consecrate those things that substitute for our Savior's physical presence, each corresponding to a particular need felt, to our, felt by our soul. Thus, we can understand, and here we have the final reflection on this point, how fraternal charity or fraternal love has the remarkable property of being a sign or, as it were, a seal of the authenticity of our life of charity. We are marked. You will know. You will be known as disciples precisely by the love that you have for one another. How often is this the case? I remember being told, and I should just be quite direct, by a lay worker at the monastery. And there was, shall we say, some truth to this. And we all know the bickering of Catholics. Boy, the online world makes it all the more worse, right? I mean, in my own way, I'm just getting angry there. I had a lay empl employee say to me, you know, I, I've worked here for many years and I couldn't figure the place out. And at a certain point, I resigned myself to thinking that all of you have come together to hate each other for the love of Jesus. And I can tell you there's not small amounts of backbiting. Often, whenever two or three are gathered, hmm, really in Christ's name, we need to all work on this. How easy it is to fall into us versus them. How easy it is. And remember, I've just spoke of fraternal charity, which is important. You will be known as my disciples by the love you have for one another. How great a scandal it is. 
when that's not there. This is quite a precious sign for we truly need to know whether we are God's friends. It is a sign that does not deceive for how could we therefore love our neighbor sincerely and effectively passing over all of our nature's aversions and revulsions and our egoism if we do not have the love of God in our hearts. This love having fraternal charity as its consummation, its full flowering, its indisputable countercheck and its inimitable seal. And yet, of course, the love of charity goes beyond these kinds of things done here below in the economy of salvation. For ultimately, charity moves our heart really beyond words, such that God is active, stirring the depths of our soul, activity of giving us grace and dwelling therein, such that the mysteries of faith in the silence of the intellect take on their true scope. We taste wordlessly. We taste without enunciation even. We experience, or at least quasi-experience, as the theologians say, the mysteries of God. And this is the gift of the Holy Spirit's gift of wisdom, which carries our minds, our intellects beyond words. And love passes over and takes on something of the condition of what being an object is. Our love becomes the object of our contemplation. And so let us not forget that, of course, for this will be, even in heaven, our experience of the Godhead and our shared experience in fraternal charity as well in the communion of saints. So let us see the full swath of charity as it's in its ultimate divine roots. And as we come to a close on our talk, we must at least set the seeds for our coming four lectures on the other virtues, the Christian virtues, the infused virtues. Yes, the natural virtues exist. There are the, the pagan virtues, so to speak, of prudence, of uh, justice, of courage, and of temperance. Yes, these exist. But the Christian also has, especially according to the Thomist, an array of Christianized virtues. But this leaves us with a question. It makes sense. Once charity departs, well, can you have hope and faith? Well, you can have a kind of dead quasi-hope and faith. They can still be present. But they're dead. They're, they're, they no longer come to their full fruition. And we must convert and re-enter a state of grace. A state of um, sanctifying habitual grace. But what of the virtues? Well, it makes sense that if my love is off and I don't love God above all things, how can I be truly prudent? How can I be truly just? Yes, the infused moral virtues would go away. And indeed they do, according to the Thomists, with the loss of charity, with a sin against charity. Be that sin through envy or through hatred of God, hatred of the divine love we're supposed to show. Through scandal or schism, through sloth, acedia whole lecture could be given on acedia as a lack in divine love. The books on acedia that have been out of late are very good on this, actually, but alas, I thought I'd talk more about it, but I'm running out of time. Okay, so it makes sense if that's gone, that the infused moral virtues are gone, but what about the natural moral virtues? Do they remain? Here I follow a number of Thomists. I mean, I believe that we're talking about, if, if not, I think Cajetan is in there, um, John of St. Thomas, Biluar, uh, Gonet, um, Heavens to Betsy, I'm thinking of one other manualist, or, you know, one of the late Thomist, and then Garagu and Maritan on very good arguing that without charity, even the acquired moral virtues lose a great deal of their character as virtue. You can have real virtue, yes, but they are more like dispositions of character than true virtues. The way that it would be put in one of the, the terms of phrases, I think this is a Cajetanian term of phrase, is that they, they're in the state, the existential state, we might say nowadays, of being able to do relatively easy things, but that's not ultimately the full character of virtue. Right. We want to say that when someone is beyond a mere disposition and they're developing their character, well, they can have the seeds of true virtue, but mm, they, they hover 
you know, between between doing good deeds and, and evil deeds. Such a person uh, describes what the soul is like without charity. You have virtue, but it's not in statu virtutis. It's not in the state of virtue. It is in statu dispositionis. It's a great argument over all this that actually Garigou comes to Maritain's uh, defense, where Maritain at one point, I can't remember if it was Father Thomas de Mom or Father Ramirez, uh, Santiago or Jacobus Ramirez, that Maritain says at one point, I didn't say that only dispositions remain. I said they remain in a state of disposition and any good scholastic should know the difference. <laughs> and he kind of passes it aside. But there's a very good little essay on this uh, in Philosophizing on uh, in Faith, which I guess technically I can go like this and point right there to that one. Uh, but it's also in Science and Wisdom uh, by Maritain. Uh, the natural virtues cannot be had if there is aversion from our supernatural end. We break the crystal of nature if we turn away from the order of grace. Because while nature cannot anticipate by its obediential potency the gift of grace, it can, however, be open to it in such a way that it can only find its fulfillment by receiving from God whatever God happens to give or wishes to give. And God wishes to give his entire life to us. And so to cast aside that love is to really put in a, a debilitated state our natural virtues. It should influence even Christian philosophers quite a bit. How often does it, though, in their analysis? It indicates as well something about actually the problem of moral philosophy in its adequate and full consideration. But that's a seed for maybe a question if anyone so desires. And, not, and one last thing, just to note then as we draw to a close, is how charity will then spill over over all the virtues. But the divine love, you know, there's an Augustinian maxim that would have all the virtues be a kind of reflection of charity. And that's true. And charity should animate as the ultimate love and reason for all that we do more and more with the purifying of our souls, every deed. Someone should look at the smallest of things we do and see the love that is in it, the little way of uh, Therese, to do small things with great love. I think it was Eve Simone who makes this passing point that yes, under charity, even the picking up of a straw could take the form of divine love. If it's done, perhaps, I don't know, to give a certain joy, I don't know, to an old ailing friend who remembers something connected from picking up straws as children, I don't know. Charity can imbue everything, yes. But the virtues remain. And even if, yes, those virtues, all of the virtues actually are open by their obediential potency, I would argue, to their elevation, each and every one of the virtues, to the supernatural order. To be ordered to a further end is not the same thing as to become that further end. And so you can do an act of kindness just at the level of justice. You can do an act of good citizenship. You can perform an act of good citizenship, natural citizenship. You can be jovial in an appropriate way. You can take recreation, not leisure in the the, the well, well laid out Piperian sense of leisure, the Aristotelian sense of leisure, but you can take recreation in a befitting way for the sake of charity. And so you take on what is called by the theologians modal supernaturality with regard to the final cause. It's not formally a supernatural act. You're taking recreation, and it's good, and God does not swallow up the good that is human recreation, but you do it in a Christianized way. So recreation remains, and yet it also bears witness to the fact that it's part of a broader life tale that has placed it within the context of the dominating love of our soul, the divine love that has been poured out into our hearts, Mag which magnetizes all of us around the friendship that God has poured out into our hearts, has brought so that he may dwell in us and we in him through the theological virtue of charity, which gives all the meaning to what then is said in the treatise on grace and gives all the meaning 
to our life here below as wayfarers. For there we see most stunningly, in our case at least, in our lives, what it means to say that grace indeed is a kind of beginning of life eternal. Go ahead, Michael. All right. Can you hear me? All right. Making sure the audio is working. Y'all go ahead and send chat questions. Make sure to send it to at reason in theology so I can distinguish them from the comments. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know what that question is, VM. Maybe try to rephrase. <laughs> or, or I'm not sure. Is that a question for Dr. Minard or? I don't know. Uh, but again, send them to at reason and theology. And Dr. Minor, while we're waiting on that, one of the questions that I had is, can you distinguish again between uh, charity and uh, justice when it pertains to being nice? You know, when we talk about being nice, we say, uh, you know, be charitable in your your words. And you said that that was actually a matter of justice rather than charity. Can you talk just a little bit more about that? Because I was I just found that interesting. Yeah. So, you know, Thomas, I think, I mean, there's a kind of foot shuffle that goes on the same as mine, and I felt it myself. So, the there's a general sense of you know we can talk about beneficence which is just kind of a it, it, it pertains to what we mean in day to day converse about like friendship doing doing good deeds for others right but then you have to ask yourself and this is sort of how he approaches it um, actually made sure to quickly pull it up just to double check that I'm not just pulling this out of my head either you know what I mean like wrongly it's like it's basically it takes on the character of the kind of acts that friends of God would do for each other right. So that's where, I mean, that's where spiritual authors provide what we could call the phenomenology of spiritual friendship, right? Because that's what you should probably do for beneficence is think about what is it like to be, you should always start with the, the, the anchor case and then apply it to the, the cases of, that are less strong, right? Mm -hmm. so the strong case, strongest case of spiritual friendship, yes, is going to deal with all of the joy and love that we share in God. But then there are all the, 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 you know, kindnesses and good deeds that we do, you know, I don't know, like, let's think, let me, I'm trying to think of a, it's like an example. Have you ever done something for some, let's think here of like a gift that you give to someone. So I'm trying to think of a, a good example of this. I think let's do it for my kids actually. Cause I would say this is an act of beneficence, right? Mm -hmm. um, or no little things. Let's do something actually very little. Cause this one sticks out. I think it's good. When I went, when I'd go to DC, uh, when I was still researching my dissertation. So um, either when my wife and I were not yet married, um, and I was you know just up here, or whenever even we were married, I was still going down for the first year of our, our marriage. Um, every time I'd go to go down to DC and stay with her brother who was living there at the time, I'd go to campus and then I'd stop at the basilica and I'd buy, you know, a a just just a, a prayer card. You know, there's a bit of like the inside joke that she likes this kitsch. Right. Like prayer card art is like the worst of, you know, sellers out in a piazza in Italy. Um, but that I can't stand it. I can't stand yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a fan I, either. <laughs> I like to found a, a whole company that makes good prayer cards. But, uh, yeah. Uh, and get rid of them for crying out loud. Yeah, I, some of those images, I, I, my opinion is some of them seem a little too uh, feminine. Yeah, no, they're they're the saccharine. Oh, I don't get it. Yeah, she, I don't get it either. She loves this stuff, so you see it, and you're like, "What the world?" Just so you know, there is like a Nouvelle Theology Fest blowing up on my phone right now. I got <laughs> to it over. I think it's good news or something, but my co-author on some on a book is like all excited, messaging me and messaging me and messaging me. Anyway, <laughs> so I bought these for her. yeah, it's generosity, but when you look at it, it's within the spousal context. It's it's sharing it, a, it's an act of kindness that's precisely for fostering our shared love of the faith right so when you look at it it's more than beneficence as just kindness or just generous generosity right so now what is that going to look like you know what does that look like for for you know um doing it for those who are less fortunate i mean there are lots of lots of levels here in between but this is this is where you put mother teresa's acts of charity right 
because they are done out of her vocation to completely give her life over to the service of the poor. So she could be a reflection in that kind of very physical way, in her case, of the generosity of God, right? It's a divine reflection of God's generosity, right? You see it, you're like, there's something more than, than merely regular generosity, right? It would be ridiculous, I think, if I were to say that last week I took an uncle uh, who has no kids and now that my dad's dead, doesn't really have any relatives in the area to the hospital for surgery, right? Get over it. I was doing my damn duty, doing my duty. Sorry. I mean, I just get, I get worked up when people try and make this into something else. I was doing my filial piety duty. Sorry. I, I can be a little bit of a Southwestern Pennsylvania guy. I don't want to get your <laughs> problem. Uh, but that was doing my duty. It's filial piety, maybe generosity, but you're like, you're not doing something that's out of the, the ordinary, right? You know, now, you know, maybe in the, you know, it's like our, our hope, I hope our conversation was because he's an ex-religious. So we shared in a lot of that by, by fraternal charity, but that's different than the beneficence that's involved, right? The, the deed I'm doing is, is in that case, it's just very practical, but it's hard. The fact that it's hard to do this is the reason why it, it, it falls down this way into, into, uh, you know, kind of humanitarian benevolence. So it's not, you know, you can't get too angry at the people who've misused it, but yeah, it's, I mean, you lose the fact, you lose the fact of Christian communion though. So the better way to start is to try to have a good theology of spiritual friendship to start with, because then you ask yourself, what are the kind of acts that someone you share in the faith with that you would do for them? Okay, now what's that going to look like for people who aren't believers, right? And that's very, 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 very important for our life now. But guess what? In the hereafter, it's not going to be important at all because the only ones who will be in heaven will be those who share in true spiritual friendship, the friendship of the blessed, right? So you have to, in an explanatory manner, try to explain what's essential first and then the other things. It gets harder and harder as you get further and further from the life of faith. So, Grant Michael asks a question here. Uh, what is the difference between a Christian being charitable and a non-Christian? Yeah. So, I mean, it's somewhat like what we're saying. So uh, language wise, we're going to use, use the word charitable. It's equivocal. It's an equivocation there, right? There's and a, and there, here's a follow up in a theological virtue sense. Yeah. So non-Christians can't be charitable unless they have implicit faith. If they're impl you know, an implicit faith that drives their life of grace, which is, yeah. you know, potentially possible for some number of souls, you know, some probably some significant number of souls that are living in a state that's, you know, this is an issue that other talks go to that sure. these sort of things you deal with Michael, right. Yeah. In other right. Talks, right. So you've got this problem of there are people who, ex who, who live with an implicit faith because of whatever concourse of reasons, maybe the gospel hasn't been preached to them or at least not adequately. That's perhaps more likely the case. Right. Okay, but them aside, if they're non-Christian in the strong sense that they have no grace, they can't be charitable in this sense. They can be generous, liberal, as Aristotle would say, but it wouldn't be out of spiritual friendship for God in his inner mystery, sharing sharing things in this world in a way that befits the, the disciples. You know, think of the disciples in the beginning of Acts. That's an example of how generosity played itself, or the beneficence played itself out for the Christians, right? The sharing, the sharing among the believers. Um, but that's done precisely in the context of making possible the life of the early church different than, you know, being generous, which is a, a virtue, but it's just the virtue of justice at the human level. What, would it be fair to distinguish then this between a natural charity versus a supernatural charity? Nope. Would, would that I, would, be... I would say liberality. I would Liberal. miss, I would, and I'm not blaming the questioner. It's not his fault. This is what the English language has done. Yeah. Um, you can do that. I prefer not to. And here's why, because inevitably it's so easy to, to, to take divine supernatural charity and turn it into charitable, charitableness. Mm. You know, there's a great, there, there's a great section in father uh, Labradette, uh, Michelle Labradette's book on justice, where he turns toward generosity, friendliness, and all of these virtues of justice. And he makes this point. It's great to see a Frenchman make in French. He says, so often people talk about charity, you know, as, as this kind of being kind and generous. And it's like, it's justice, you know? So I would just say liberality. Generous might be the gener generous is probably the better case. Here's one from Marsby. 
Has Dr. Minor delved uh, any further into li any literature surrounding Maritain's theological opinion of the majority, maybe all of the reprobate, eventually reaching limbo? Yeah, I mean, have I delved into the literature? No. Uh, I don't know what the literature was. You, you know what? I actually didn't know Maritain held that position. That's that's interesting. Oh, no, but don't you remember uh, when Father Christian was on it? Now, I remember Father Christian uh, no, posited that. Oh, but no, no, it wasn't him. It was. um. Oh, heavens to Betsy. Uh, um, Jared, yes, I heard Father Coppice ooh. posit that. Well, it was he and between he and Jared Goff. Right. Jared Goff, Dr. Goff played it out almost exactly, mm -hmm. almost exactly like Maritan does. Um, where where does he discuss that? Just so, so that I can read it. First of all, let's be honest. So what he said, what he says is like all the reprobate would lose the penalty of senses, but they'd not, they'd still remain in the limbo state. And it's, it's a thing from the thirties that he privately published. And then it got stuck in, um, uh, untrammeled approaches. I mean, I don't right. follow it. I mean, you know, he basically posits, he's like, well, we can't, he's like, that's his dare. We hope moment. Right, right, right. Okay. That to be honest, is a philosopher playing around with ideas. It's a reverie. And he refers to it, um, as such, but mm -hmm. actually now that you say that, mm -hmm. Uh, or your question or ask in this volume um, of from the American Maritime Association, the things that matter. I just happen to have it here because I have an essay in it. And I keep my my publications. I keep on this little turntable. Um, the first two essays are on this in Maritime. Uh, Lawrence Feingold, who wrote the excellent book on um, natural desire to see God, uh, has Maritime's eschatological reverie and the fittingness of limbo. Um, and then Travis Dumday, uh, Dumsday also has Maritan on Limbo and Demonic Beatitude. I need to read that. I I have not been able to do that, and I, I wasn't aware he maintained that. That's a very interesting. Yeah, that, that first essay in Untrammeled Approaches is is both a good and quirky uh, mm -hmm. volume of his late life essays. Very mm -hmm. good. I mean, it's got really good stuff in it. Even though if you're like, it's like it's like the intuitions are good and neat. Sometimes sure. conclusions, you know, are trouble, you know, problematic. Um, My only concern with saying that the majority of the uh, damned would eventually reach this limbo state is it seems to be a very novel view. Oh, it's so novel that it should be. And, and, and since it's so novel, I, I think that how could we, yeah, how, how could this be the truth if, very few people have I, ever held this history. I absolutely agree. Now, this is an example. You know, some people will light themselves on fire and anger at Maritan. And listen, I know Maritan's weaknesses. He's being too much of a philosopher, right? Here's how it goes, right? And it's not the majority. Yeah. He says maybe all. But he says, right. you know, basically it's like, well, is it repugnant to the divine will? Well, that is such a philosopher's way of asking that question, right? right? right. But if the theologian considers, you know, what has been the tradition sure he knows that he's going against it too but it's like he can't help himself because he always thinks in this kind of philosophical mode you know even though he's dealing here with a supernatural truth and it's the scholastic thing you know like that's the scholastic sin is to like slightly metaphysicize your theology um but it's fascinating to watch because guess what? Here on Reason and Theology that position was redone by Professor Goff. Yeah <laughs> Dr. Goff did it like right in front of me, like I'm thinking, I hadn't read it for years, Michael. Yeah. I'm like, wait. You I'm did point married. out that that was Maritain's view. Now that I think about it, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I got up and got it off. Yeah. I'm like, I, re I remember that now. I forgot that you. Okay. Yeah, they were talking and talking, and I was like, whatever. I'm going to go and look this up. <laughs> I remember that now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've done about 500 shows, literally yeah, over yeah. 500 shows in about. Two and a half years, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, but I need to read that. That that's interesting. Okay. Uh, there was another question on here that I saw. Um, VM asks, "What is the most charitable way to approach a fellow brethren of Christ who is the who for the moment does not take the moral demands of the faith seriously?" Yeah, of course. I mean, it is different from relationship to relationship, right? I mean, it's 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 a real tact to figure it out. Um, you know, it's like, what do you do with 
It's like election season. And what do you do whenever you start hearing every everyone who grew up in the the era of um, whatever, Mario Cuomo, whoever the Cuomo was who, who had the famous, you know, I'm privately against abortion, but publicly, it, you know, publicly I support it or whatever. And they take that up as their own position, even as, as voters and as thinkers, right? Um, so that's something where you don't even have the actual sin, but you have a denial. I mean, you're really running some, the edges on some problems of, of the presuppositions for the ascent of faith, because you're not adhering to the church's teaching on this, right? And trying to dig yourself out of some of the stuff that motivates that is so hard. You know, you, you basically, you know, you, I've done it before with people where I'm pretty clear. I'm like, it's not the church's position. You know, I've got all sorts of tricks in my bag for being lighthearted without, you know, as, as is appropriate. Um, I mean, this is what this is why you, the, the gift of counsel is very much needed for that. Then, boy, the spirit has to give you the words. Um, you know, uh, this is the same for so many of the hot button topics. But, you know, let's you know, once again, let's try and think of it in the in the context of. Uh, you know, the context of a, a relationship that's pretty is pretty decent or is good even. Um, like even this morning now here, it's like I'm praying out someone else's sins. I wish I had the opposite here. So I'm not trying to do this, but it was like today, you know, there's just something like very, very minor, um, something that gets on my wife's nerves. Um, and understandably, she's pretty justified in it being annoying um, in the world. Um, and she made a remark and I, I was like, that's kind of, I actually said, you know, it's kind of, you know, crappy, but I didn't say crappy. Um, I said, that's a pretty crappy part of you know your temperament i said if people hear you talk like that it, they're just going to shut off it was for something she was doing today uh online i was like people are just going to shut off if you have that attitude about it right mm -hmm. and that's all it took because we had the relationship to be able she's like you're right you know um you know and it, i mean i'm pointing outward i'm sure it can come up with examples for me um but this is why it's it gets harder and harder the further you are out and it becomes tempting to say you don't need to do fraternal correction right because it's too hard that's that whole, you need all the conditions that are there. No, I mean, you, you really should. Like, if you've got relatives, you know, it's like, what, what did I try to do with my stepdad all the time? You know, whenever he was exempting himself from the faith, you know? So, I, it takes a, a great deal of tact. But it's actually important, I guess. That's the thing. Even though it takes tact, it doesn't mean that it's something that should be tossed aside. Uh, Weinshul asks one more thing. Yeah, to imagine the amount of divine the, the amount of divine love and ability to suffer it takes. Hence, you know, it's not surprising that it's under charity, right? It needs to be supported by the love of God for this person's sake. So it's not supposed to be easy. It takes you know the highest of all the gifts of God to even be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So just something to keep in mind as well. So, um, Weinshul asks, can a guy fraternally correct a girl, and vice versa? Happens all the time in the minor household. <laughs> can two uh married people non-married people not married I'm sorry. i know i know <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know depending i mean as long as it's a, you know yeah because you're fellow you know fellow believers um you know how would it be possible i mean priests could never fraternally correct one of his female um parishioners you know uh and so like you know we we do have spiritual concourse with all sorts of folks you know one should be deferential, you know. I shouldn't just go up to, you know, my my buddy, one of the the fellow cantors at our parish, uh, Diane Harmon. I, I often call her. I say to Diane, I'd, I say I call her Bubba, but she gets you know she says, "Oh, don't call me Grandma," you know. Uh, but I get along with her really well, you know. And she, I mean, she's really, you know, lived I, I think just such a devoted life to our parish, and the parish was very good with her um, when she had some tragedy in her, in her youth of life and, and really gave her structure. So I think that there's a kind of, you know, spiritual bond between two, uh, let us not say Byzantine Catholics, but Greek Catholics there, but you know, it would be very appropriate, probably more for her to correct me, you know? Um, but in the appropriate circumstances, one could correct Diane, never would need to. I don't think Diane would ever see this video. Not that I'd ever need to correct Diane, <laughs> but I think, yeah, it's appropriate. Well, that that's all the questions that I see. Dr. Minard, as usual, I want to thank you for doing this, taking your time out. I know you're extremely busy. You have a lot of classes that you're dealing with, a lot of students. And so to to come on and do this, it's it's greatly appreciated. We're we're benefiting tremendously from it. No, oh, I love it. I love it. It's busy. It is busy though. <laughs> I I get it. I totally get it. And, 
And, wh- and what's the topic for the, the next lecture? Ah, yeah, we can call it Christian conscience or prudence. Now, we did something earlier than that, so we'll come up with what to call it, but it's the treatise on prudence. Prudence, nice. Okay. That that should be really good. I um I, l- I look forward to that. And um, like I said, I really appreciate you doing this because I have looked around and I haven't seen any lectures on the Summa Theologica th- that I that I've come across. Yeah, they you, might be out there, but I yeah, haven't. Yeah, you seen can find the Thomistic Institute has these little like vignettes, you know, okay. and they're I mean they're solid, right? But it, it's right. it's very much running through the, the things, and yeah. occasionally there's a kind of. Thomas can talk in 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 Thomist speak without realizing it. I mean, and I'm sure I use the verbiage as well, but it, it's a little bit like that, even though it's Aquinas 101. Um, and that's a real danger. I wish that they they'd watch that a little bit more. You know, it sounds like Latin. I can hear the Latin at times in their in their language. But I mean, they're good videos. They're very well produced. They're not off the cuff like I can be. Um, but yeah, there's not a ton on this. I wish that there were just like a well. I guess that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> Right. It's You're like filling a void. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like write the book that you wish you, you that you want to read. So, you know what? That's one of the reasons why there were multiple reasons why I started the show. But one of the reasons why is I felt that there wasn't enough uh, content out there addressing Eastern Orthodoxy and, and Roman Catholicism, you know, having an mm-hmm. interaction between the two. So uh, let me go in and create that myself since I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Uh, that, that's one of the reasons. So, yeah, yeah. that's why I've done. I mean, it's the it's the conservative in me, but so many of my texts are tr- translations. Mm-hmm. I'm just like no one else is doing it, so I mean, okay, Might as well. <laughs> as well, you're one of the few that could do it too. So. Right. Where's your soul down? This has been just. I mean, it's the end of this year. I'm going to look back at the the stack as long as it all comes out. I'm going to be like, geez, Louise. Um, so thank goodness my my mother in law's back to help him with the kids a bit. That's helped a bit. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> all well, right, again, well, good, I, great to I, be here. Yeah, and I, I appreciate it once again. And uh, yeah, by the way, did you b- before I let you go? Did you have any um, anything that you wanted to plug at this time? Any books that you oh, wanted to tell us? Uh, about? Well, up here, I wish I could have it down. Uh, it's like trying to get my finger to go the right direction, right? In the blue, uh, common sense, Thomistic common sense is coming out. Uh, you can find it on Emmaus Academic. You can find it on uh, Amazon now as well for pre order. I think it says June eighteenth. I thought it was more like June eighth. But June eighteenth, um, great text. It's it's got kind of a, a pricey of a lot of main themes of Thomism. How common sense cognition, not necessarily like Thomas Reed. It's not just like Thomas Reed, the common sense philosopher, but how we transition from our our common experience to philosophical reflection, and then how all of that applies actually to dogmatic development, because it's actually really addressing the modern the modernist crisis. It's written hot on the heels of Bashendi Dominici Gregis. Even a hundred years later, it's just as relevant today. It's got some great endorsements on it uh, that are humbling. Uh, good text. It's a very good text. Maritan said that it's one of the few texts he would recommend as having merit on its own right as a as a scholastic philosophy text. He felt like too many scholastic philosophy texts weren't written philosophically, um, but he he really to in his last days in the peasant of the Garon said. That would be on his short list. So mm-hmm. I gotcha. Well, uh, again, thank you for coming on. And everybody, I appreciate y'all's participation and interaction and questions that y'all had there for Dr. Minor. I look forward to the next one with him. And I hope y'all stay tuned for that as well. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to this channel, hit the like button, hit the bell for notifications so you can be aware of upcoming uh, shows in uh, your YouTube feed. And also check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you would like to get access to extra material and also support what we're doing here. So but, uh, once again, I really appreciate y'all watching and interacting there in the chat till next time. God bless.